I mean, there's been a few little, there's been some Twitter stuff every now and again, you know, cr- not not criticism as such, but people who refer to the budget all the time. And do you, do you feel like it gives you a little bit of a disservice given that some of the play, you know, Ben being a prime example, Dylan another example, that you've almost had a mix of, you've got players like Rob who are at one end of their career who've obviously established they've, they've been, you know, really good professional players. But you have, I mean, Jamie McDonald was another one, players that, you pluck out of sort of relative obscurity and then they come into your environment and they flourish a little bit. You don't seem to, you know, it's not all about the money in that sort of position, is it? I mean, you're looking at pulling players out of Sunday League football and turning them into, you know, potential football league players. Yeah, I mean, this, if you if you want to call it criticism, it, you know, I know what you're talking about on uh, <laughs> that fella on Twitter the other week. Um, but that's, that's the perception that we carry as a club. And I think it stems from, obviously, the FA Cup and, um, you know, the FA Cup run a few years ago. When Toby's come out and said he invested a lot of the money to get, you know... Sorry, just had a call come through. Yeah. Um, you know, he invested a lot of money to, to climb the, the leagues. And, you know, he's... At, He's at a stage, you know, we've, we've obviously hit the bar a couple of times and stuff, but I think um, it was two or three seasons in the league below throwing strong money at, the, at getting out of it, which, you know, and I think that that stigma has, has carried through. Listen, we've always been competitive within our area, within the Northwest, in terms of what we can pay, but we've never been... We've never been, you know, in the top three, four um, paying teams in the in the division. And I think if you look at this season, we're, we're probably sixth, seventh, maybe even eighth um, when it comes to when it comes to budgets. Um, but I don't go on about it because if teams have got good budgets and they're up at the top of the league, then they're doing the job. They're doing the right things. If teams haven't got, you know, good budgets and, and they're up there, then they're punching above the weight and they're doing even better. Um, but I don't I don't know how fun about it because it is what it is. You know, I've said to Toby this season, if we've got a thousand pounds a week to try and recruit twenty players and that's all we can do, then we'll make a fist of it and we'll have a go. But um I think in terms of trying to get the players it doesn't matter to me whether they've played for the dog and duck or Barcelona if they can come in and, and do what we want them to do and they improve us we'll, we'll sign them if we can um, you know the players you talk about you know Jamie McDonald that's you know he's one who's the way that finished was a, was a disappointing totally disappointing um, situation obviously Ben's the other way you know for him to go from to jump the steps he's jumped is it's it's down to, it's down to him. Yet we've helped him on the way. Yet we've given him little pointers and we've given him an opportunity. But it, it's the player, and I think you know I'm speaking to a player now who again I worked with at Tramia, a young lad, and um, you know I'm saying to him, you're 20. The opportunity that you've got outweighs any opportunity you had at Tramia. And the reason being, at Tramia, and this is no Mickey Mellon's being a top, or is a top manager with with what he's done, his promotions and, and the teams he's built and the teams he's put together. And, and, of course, the jobs he's had. You don't get them jobs if you're not a good manager. But Mickey, if you look at his sides, a built-on experience. The whole squad he's got at Tramia is, is experience. You know, he's got a lot of players in that team who are, who are well into the 30s. Um but the opportunity of, the, of, a, of a player who's 20, who I'm speaking about, coming to us, he'll play. He'll play in the first team. And he'll play in a, in a, in a level that's getting more and more respect because people know there's players at our level who can step up because the gap isn't as big as what people think. But what players have to realise is that they might be getting 150 quid, but they're not too far away from earning. 1500 quid a week if they put a run of games together and 
listen, you can earn that in two leagues above, 1,500 quid. You know, so lads, young lads especially, have got to realise they're not a million miles away from earning four figures. And, but we can give them the opportunity to do that, and I will. It doesn't bother me. You, met, you mentioned Ben there. It, it's a bit of a shame for him that he got the move to Blackpool and then sort of after a few weeks training, they've been in lockdown. How do you think that will impact his opportunity moving forward? No, I don't think it. I don't think it will impact his opportunity because I know he'll go back into pre-season and he'll be he'll be fit. He'll be flying. Um, obviously, the new manager they've brought in from Liverpool has got, a, you know, a history of working with younger players, and the way Ben trains, and I've said it before, the way he train he trains how he plays, which is his his biggest his biggest attribute, I think. Is that every everything he does, he wants to win. He's disappointed when he gets beat. He'll work on things. I, I, I was watching the uh, reading something about Ronaldo with table tennis, and he got beat in table tennis. And he went and bought a table tennis table. And two weeks later, he he challenged the person who beat him, and uh, and then he he went and beat him. Well, Geno played squash with Ben, um, and Geno Geno beat him. And Ben was furious. And I'd speak to people who live near Ben and I'd say, oh, have you seen Ben? And Oh, yeah. I've just seen him go and go in a sports centre to play squash. Who's he playing with? I don't know. I think he was on his own. And that's him. That's him for you. Um, you know, and that'll endear him to everybody he works with and especially especially his new manager because, uh, because he'll run all over people in training. He did that when he came in from day one and... You know, he'll do that. And I said to him, "Don't be overawed. Don't be looking at players as though, you know, he's been he's been near there and everywhere." I remember I remember speaking to him about um, when we signed Brody, and he said, "I, I googled I googled that Brody. He went for three hundred grand, didn't he?" And this was what was brilliant about Benny. So sort of naive to the footballing world, the, the horrors that it can show and what have you. And um, he said he went for three hundred grand him, and then and then he was like he was saying to me, "Is that him who went for three hundred grand <laughs> to different training sessions and finishing sessions?" I was like, "Yeah, that's him." Like, Has he been injured or something? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he was he was brilliant with him. He was oh, he was, he was funny. He was really funny. The, as I say, the naivety of him, but you know he he'll go on. He'll go on and do well for for Blackpool. Yeah, I mean it's 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 similar really with Blackpool, isn't it, in terms of the players he's around? Because he's got people like Jay Spearing in that dressing room, who's played in the Premier League and possibly in the Champions League, even for Liverpool. Yeah. Um, Nathan Delfonso, who's played Premier League for Villa. There's names in there, and I guess you know, like you say, it's in his character. He won't be. He'll still run all over him. Doesn't matter who they, who they are. Yeah, it'll. He looks at it as a challenge, and and that's the best way to look at it. And it, and like you say. He wants to win. We'd, we'd finish on Thursday nights with five sides, and if his team lost, he, he'd be having a he'd be having a go with the lads in the warm up on the Saturday because he lost. You know, he'd be he's that way. Um, he's that competitive, and he's a winner. And you know, when you've got ability with those sort of um, those traits about you, you know, it's it's a it's a strong combination, and, and it'll see him have a good career. You mentioned Ronaldo there. Um, if anyone follows you on Twitter, you'll see that your Twitter profile is you challenging one Cristiano Ronaldo. It's nice yeah. of you to uh, to let him out of your pocket for us to enjoy. Um, and I think you've aged significantly better than he has. Yeah. Um, what What do you remember <laughs> about? That looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, What do you remember about sort of going up against him? Um. Well, I remember. The main thing I remember from that game is having a bit with Alan Smith because um, he left one on me. Mm. I just laid a ball off and he left one right down the back of me. And um, being the being the quiet person that I that I was on the pitch, you know, I said to him, oh, I, "I'm going to kick you back, um, but in a different way." And that was the path of the game because I left one right on him as he cleared the ball. 
bit of a naughty one, but I thought I'm not. I don't care who you are. And um, but that on Ronaldo, me, me lad's got it next to his bed, and um, he says to me, uh, so what? He always says it to me. My little girl says it to me. So, so what happened then? Did, did he run past you? And I, I said, why do you think he ran past me? You know, why has he got to run past me? I said, he actually tried to run past me and it went out for a goal kick. He overkicked it. And um, I mean, lad doesn't believe me. He, he doesn't believe me. But, you know, but that game, Jesus, that that was uh, playing for playing for Peterborough that, um, against United. And they had Van Nistelrooy, Ferdinand, um, Park. Cleverson, Rooney, Giggs, um, trying to think who else played. Uh, You'd take, take you lightly then. Van der Sar in goal. Um, and I didn't realise how big um, Van Nistelrooy was. Giuseppe mm. Rossi played. Um, I didn't realise how big Van Nistelrooy was. But it wasn't that he was like, he, he must have been six foot three. Easy, but it was how deep he was. His chest, it wasn't like broad, it was out, out there. Mm-hmm. And he scored, I think Giuseppe Rossi got an attic and he scored too. But he was unbelievable, Van Nistelrooy. Unbelievable. He was the he was their best player by a mile, by a ma- just the way he was. He, he was scarily good. Giggs was obviously good, and they were all good, obviously, mm-hmm. some World Cup winners and everything in there. But Van Nistelrooy that day, I couldn't believe how good he was. He like changed my opinion on because I thought, oh, he's just a goal scorer. But mm. Wow, what a player! What yeah. a player he was. You do often think about that about Van Nistelrooy like that that he's just a penalty box poacher. But in general, you know, when you when you're a League One, League Two player and you you get the chance to play against a Premier League side or a, a side of world standing like Man United, does it does it make you think? You know. Are they, are we, I can't believe we're playing the same game here. It does. I mean, we played, when I was at Chester, we played against Blackburn in the FA Cup. And um, we had a goal disallowed at, with about 15 minutes to go at 0-0. And we, we, lost, uh, we lost 2-0 in the end. And they brought Mark Hughes and Mark Spence on up front. Mm. And he took Egg and Stad off and somebody else. But... They had a team full of internationals, Stigging with Bjornaby, um, I think Henning Berg played, um, David Dunn played, who I know we were grow up grew up playing against. Mm. And um and it was one of the, that was one of those games where you thought you can c- compete. And they were a Premier League side. And you and you you felt well, I felt as a player playing in that list, I'm not saying it was a Premier League player. But I felt in that game, I I could compete against who I was playing against. Mm. Against United, that was a totally different level. Totally mm. different. And the, and the Peterborough side I was playing in was a different level to the Chester side I was playing in. Mm. So, it was... Listen, I played against United for Chester at, at the Diva in a pre-season friendly. Mm. And Paul Scholes done something with the ball corner came in got headed out and he's trapped it on the half volley with the outside of his foot I'm on the edge of the box and so is he he was obviously they worked that corner to him where he hits the volley mm. and um, they weren't doing that but they put the ball in the box it got headed out and he's trapped it on the half volley and he's put back spin on it but I'm, I've followed the ball thinking it's going one way he's trapped it the other way I'm still going over there somewhere and he's wrapped his foot round this shot, and it's come off the outside of the post. And I'm thinking, wow. Mm. And they're, they're the, you know, we played at Cambridge, we played um, Everton, and, and we beat Everton 4 2. And Andy Parkinson played up front for us, who used to be at Tramway. We signed him that summer. He scored two, he tortured them. Jack Yelton and Lescott were centre half. They had a strong side on. Nuno Valenti, left back, Van der Maeda, Rodwell, Phil Neville, Andy Johnson. And it was part of Cambridge had sold John Ruddy to Everton. It was, it was a pre season friendly. Moyes was manager and Arteta played. And um, he took a short corner and I've gone out to him. And he didn't touch the ball. 
the ball was rolling sort of towards me and I didn't dive in and he didn't touch the ball, but he still sent me, sent mm. me out the way and the ball carries on rolling straight and he just runs onto it. And that, and, and like, you know, when you come up against them, like who are the, the ones that are elite, yeah, mm. you just little things you do, little touches, little movements, feints and stuff. They're just, just different different levels and you know as we were speaking before I hope the Premier League gets the finish just because of that and mm. if it's a tournament brilliant even better mm. yeah do, do you what do you have do you have any like mementos or prized possessions from your playing days like did you swap shirts and all that palaver or not no I was never one who done that you know I never I never really done that because uh, I don't know I just the, the black didn't really fit in with your persona on the pitch, I suppose, asking someone for a shirt. Yeah, it wasn't. I don't think it was really me, but I think the Blackburn game was. Uh, I was fuming. I was fuming with. Fuming, not like me to be angry with a referee, but I was fuming with the referee for disallowing the goal. And then uh, one of their goals was a, he gave a free kick against us, which wasn't a free kick they scored off. Um, so I just like trudged off disappointed and angry so I didn't get involved with anyone and the Man United game everyone was all over Rooney's shirt and I just thought oh uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bother my my mementos of the pictures that I have and, and stuff and little clips of them and that I'd sooner have I'd sooner have them you know the only shirts I've got is when we won the league at Chester I kept that shirt when we won the Four Nations when I played for England C I've got mm. that shirt and medal um and the caps um yeah and i've played in numerous playoff finals and and not won um two for cambridge two for luton and then medals in a box somewhere because i don't want finals medals you know they they don't incest me so but uh but yeah so my mementos are the, are the pictures that i can show the kids really so, so who would you say is the best player you've played with then? Um, no one in that Rockdale player. side would have thought. Uh, Maybe Graham Lancashire. Andy Morris, remember Andy Morris? Yeah, Andy, Andy Morris is a quality player. Um, best player I played with was probably at, when I was at Blackpool and I was 16 maybe. Hmm. In fact, no, I wasn't. I was, I was still at school, and I played for the A team over in Bebbington Oval against Tranmere, mm. and Kevin Sheedy was at Blackpool then, right? And he was playing in a game for a bit of fitness, and I came. I actually came on left wing, and he was left back, and um, and he had an absolute wand of a left foot. He was, he was ridiculous, um, he, but obviously it wasn't a, wasn't what you call a, a proper game. But there was a, there's been a, there's been a few players, but but none like sort of superstars, if you know what I mean. No, no mm. one like who's come from the Premier League who who's played. Um, but like players like James Quinn, you know, he did play in the Premier League. You know, mm. he was someone who he p- played for Northern Ireland and he went over to Holland and played. And he was a top player, funny fella, a really funny fella as well. He's assistant mm. at Solly Bowl now. And uh, he was quality. Mickey was a good player, Mickey Mellon um, mm. at Blackpool. Um, but they've always been sort of good at good at that level, do you know what I mean? So it's been quite a few have been good at that level. Um, Sean St. Ledger at Peterborough was a good player, although he, you know, he's, as, a, as a character at times, he didn't do himself any favours, which probably makes you forget a little bit about him when you're talking about good players you've played with. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's been a few of that type, you know, at League One kind of level, League Top, top End, League Two level. Um, but so I'd probably have to say for its terms of names was Kevin Cheesy when I was fifteen. <laughs> That's about it. Or going back a little bit further when I was at Liverpool and played with Stephen Gerrard when I was about thirteen. So that might be one. But, uh, yeah. But yeah. 
But I played against them. Um, we played Man United at the cliff. Remember when Cantona got banned? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember when he got banned for the Kung Fu kick and all that? Well, every, every week, United had arranged um, training ground games, like bounce games. Mm-hmm. And uh, they arranged them against all the Northwest clubs and to, to sort of keep him playing a game. And we played them twice over a, like a six week period. And I was subbing both games. I was a first year YTS, whatever, 16, 17. And, um, and he played. And to be honest, there wasn't much point in the games being played because they were being played for him. And he just walked around like mm. he couldn't be asked. Yeah. But but some of the things he'd done when he got the ball was ridiculous again. You were like, you were just standing there wide eyed looking at this as Eric Cantona were playing against. And, you know, there was some young lads coming through at United at the time, the Beckhams and stuff, Skulls, Nevilles, and all them, because they would have been at that age. Um, but he just walked around. He just walked around. So, mm. um, but yeah, there's. Obviously, you you play against those those players, and but like I said before, you you do you do understand why they are top top elite players. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. moving going back to the present day, I suppose. What? How do you see the next few months panning out in terms of building for next season? Um. Well, I think like I think like most, you know. This next week or so will be would normally be sort of sorting out players who you've got, sorting out players who who you want. You know, obviously speaking and doing the right thing by the lads that you you're not going to keep. Um, you know, I don't know. Does 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 the way it is change that? Should it change that? Should you should you still be the same? You know, I've spoke to a few of the lads who, who do definitely want to keep next season. Um, you know, I've spoke to I've spoke to a couple. Um, I've spoke to one or two who've been at other clubs who have contacted me um, and have said that, you know, I'd be interested in them. Um, you know, but in terms of sorting deals out and stuff, it's like you said before about... about Baseford and South Shield, it's what you do with it, you know, where do you go with it, where do you start with it? Um but I think you've just got to sort of pencil everything in place, haven't you? You've got to you've got to try and be as organised as you can for when it starts and, and try and have as many over the pocket as you can for when you can actually do anything concrete. Um that's the main thing. But like everything and now, you know, there's the the, the way people are able to communicate has, has massively exploded in this period. So that's what we've we've got to be doing. We've got to be in constant contact with the players and you know myself and Bees are. Um so we've just got to make sure we we keep our ear to the ground to what's going on. And that's what not being at saying and not being at games, that's what you're missing. But everyone's in the same boat. You're missing the rumors, oh yeah, he's available or he's leaving there. You know, so you quickly get on the phone and you jump on it. But like you say, just just having having a plan um, for when things start is is the main thing, which is which is what we've got. So if we can do any more, we will. That's I suppose that's one of the things that you've always spoke to me about, and you know, other people who I speak to have, have spoke about you is that your communication is, is second to none as a manager. You know, you like to meet players before you sign them and, and all that sort of stuff, whereas other managers perhaps aren't quite up to that sort of one-to-one contact. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, we talk about we talk about last summer's recruitment, if you like. Now, I'd, I'd, met, I'd met all the players who we signed. Um, you know, and you get a feel for players, and um, and I'll be dead honest. There was a couple I never got a hundred percent feeling for, but I kind of gave them the benefit of the doubt because um, because I knew they were good players. Um, but you know, wrongly, I, I, I went against me gut on a couple of them, um, and that and that told so. 
I think it's important that you go with your gut when you meet people and and because you, you're very rarely wrong. Um but I think I think meeting people and looking them in the eyes is is key. I think um, you know, getting a feel for them because we can all we can all tell a, a salesman, can't we? We can all tell we can all tell someone who's who's paying your lip service and telling you what you want to hear. Um, we all we all know what what those characters are like, and and I think it's important that that you do that. Um, the other thing I do as well is like you know I speak to as many people as I can about them, get as many get as many points of view as I can, you know, about them as a character, about them as a player, um, because from a management point of view, you could phone me up as, as you know, being a manager and say. What's he like? What's he like as a player? And he could be a manager's dream. Could be everything you want. But you could phone half a dozen of his teammates up and go, you know what? He's not this. He's not, you know, he does this. He's not that. You know, so you've got to get both points of view because you've got to want them to, they've got to fit for A, what you do, what you want them to do on the pitch, but B, which is as important, if not more, how they are in the dressing room from a player's point of view and a manager's point of view. Um, so just try and speak to as many people as I can. And, and the other thing as well, which which I always do is, I always try and find, or if, I, I more often than not know players who they, they've played with, or if they're, the next, if they're a younger player and they played with certain experienced players that I know, I always try and get that experienced player to speak to them. And say, listen, this is a good opportunity for you, um, blah blah blah, and and try and sort of not cajole them to come to us. If they don't want to come, then fine. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna break their arms to get them here. But I think it's important you try and push as many buttons to, to 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 make it happen and make it right. That's that's what I've what I spend most of my time doing. So so you so at this point you you sort of know who you want to keep from last season roughly that way yeah at. yeah yeah I do yeah um you know I think um I, listen if if every single player um if there wasn't another player available and, and I signed every one of the players from last season it, I wouldn't I wouldn't be broken hearted um but I do think we need certain areas to be freshened up a little bit. Um, you know, not everywhere, not everywhere. Just just one or two areas that need to be freshened up. That need a bit of a bit of younger blood, um, and to you know, and to and to push us on again. Give us a bit more life. Give us a bit more legs. Give us a bit more energy and. You know, a bit more youthfulness in in terms of how we look. I think that's going to be that's going to be important. It is, ultimately, it is a young man's game. Um, you know, it's about being fit and and that's you know we and and of course with with certain cuts that we'll we'll naturally incur. You know, that's what that's what the probably going to point us in that market anyway. But it's it's where I want to be. It's you know it's how I want to see the squad evolve. Well, Paul, thanks very much for that. Hopefully it won't be too long until we uh, see some football again. Matt, thanks for uh, your time as well. Um, Please do give it a like and a share on, on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, and we'll see you next time. Cheers, mate.